This has been a time in America to celebrate life's good harvest. Many of us no longer have to harvest our own food, but there is another harvest we should all participate in. Take this time to collect in your heart all the people and the moments you have had in your life this year that you can be thankful for. What do you think of? Your family? Your friends? Having a place to call home? Your job? Your health? Or just the simple fact that you woke up this morning and you are here, right now? These are all good gifts that come from one place. God. Often we can forget to thank Him for being the source of all the blessing we receive in our lives. Psalm 106 and 1 says, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. As you reap the harvest of blessings God has given you, take a moment, this moment, to thank God. Why? Because He is good and His love endures forever. Happy Thanksgiving once again. Welcome to Emmaus Community Church. We're glad that you're here this morning. Um, we are excited about the Thanksgiving season. Um, we have so much to be thankful for, and so this morning we will be talking about that in our message. And we have just a few scriptures we're going to be focusing on and really keying in. And, and it's a great introduction as next week we'll begin our Christmas series. So we're excited about that. We finished up with Ezra and Nehemiah last week. Uh, so it was great to see God bringing the people back, rebuilding and reforming, uh, and yet we saw that without Jesus, it's all missing something. And so when we go through life and when we're seeking to return, rebuild, reform, that we always need to be doing that with Jesus in mind and with thanksgiving in our hearts is what we'll talk about today. So before we get into our message this morning, just a few announcements for you uh, to, as we get started um, to... Uh, go ahead and let you know a few things that are going on. The first one, which I don't remember which one's which, so what do we got? Okay, that's right. On Monday night, uh, we have discipleship group. We have a small group uh, at 6.30, so if that's something you're interested in. Uh, we are in the kind of the middle of a study, but we would be fine if somebody wants to jump in. Um, you might have a little bit of homework to catch up on, but that's okay. Uh, but we have a group that meets, it's both men's and women's, uh, at uh, the church office on 6.30 on Mondays, uh, which we don't have actually group this coming Monday. Um, I forgot about that. We, we don't have it the week, the last week of the month. So I think Kelly and I said we can take care of something tomorrow night at Monday. Uh, no, we can't. So <laughs> tomorrow night we do not have group. Uh, Friday morning there also is a women's group uh, at 8 30 a.m. So if you're available during that time and you'd like to join, uh, that's another great group to be a part of. Uh, a couple of ways that we want to be helping out in this Christmas season, and uh, there's uh, the outreach has the giving tree tags. Now that's something if you want to do, you need to get a hold of me ASAP. Uh, because those, I believe, are due on December 3rd. Uh, and so what happens is you sign up for a tag uh, through either the app or on one of these cards, and you write your name. Uh, and if I don't have your phone number or email address, write that on there. And then you write down Giving Tree Tag, and I get you a tag. Uh, you buy specific gifts that are down on for a specific family. So if you sign up for a tag, please do it. Uh, we're trying to take care of families, and we're trying to help families have a Christmas that may not have a Christmas uh, without that. And so you can sign up for that through either the link that we emailed out. Otherwise, you can also uh, sign up through the card. Also, we have the Sleep in Heavenly Peace, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, Build Day that I am signed up for. I don't know if I'm going to be the only Emmaus person signed up for that, but <coughs> Sleep in Heavenly Peace is an organization that builds beds for families and for kids who don't have beds. The motto is, we don't want any kid in our community to sleep on the floor. And so they sponsor these build days. I believe this one is actually sponsored by uh, I-90 Enterprise. It's not sponsored by us, but what we wanted to do is couple alongside organizations that are working in our community, and so you can sign up for that. If you're interested in that same way, either uh, through the email link uh, that I sent out, where you actually would sign up directly with Sleep and he with Heavenly Peace, otherwise give me a card and I can email that directly to you as well. And you can sign up for that. That's on uh, December 11th. So if that's something you're interested in, they provide all the tools, they provide all the training. You just show up and you work. <coughs> Excuse me. Because of the mic. And so it just wasn't working. Um, we also want to let you know about the calendar coming up. On Christmas Eve, we will be having a Christmas Eve service. Um, 
We know people will be potentially traveling, but we always want to make sure that that's a, a family tradition at our churches that we would gather on Christmas Eve. We do that 4.30 because we know that sometimes people have family gatherings that night, but we want to give you an opportunity for that to be a part of your family's tradition. <coughs> and so we are gathering at the church office at 4.30 on Christmas Eve uh, for that. Uh, unfortunately, Tri-County is not available, but we do have the church office there at 6 West Fulton Street. And then also one last <coughs> uh, calendar thing is the last Sunday of the month, uh, December 26th, we will actually be taking that Sunday off. It's the day after Christmas. We will have had the Christmas Eve service. So we're having a Sabbath Sunday where we're going to be having people worship at home with their families. Um, uh, it gives a break for the, the volunteers and then also Tri-County has some rentals that's happening over the Christmas break. And so the last Sunday of the month, there is no service. We're taking that as a break, as a rest. Uh, rest is something that's important and so we're going to do that as well. And then finally, next week is our breaking bread meal. Every first Sunday of the month, we always eat together. And this, week, this time, I believe it's lasagna. Is that right? It's lasagna. I love lasagna. Uh, so we're going to be having that next week. So with that, let's stand up and greet one another. Well, hopefully the tickle in the throat is gone. I promise it's just a tickle, although I did go sanitize my hands afterwards. So we'll hope that that goes away, not only because it's not like I need my voice for my job or anything like that, so, um, but that's okay. You guys are gracious, and I thank you for that. Well, this morning, once again, we are going to be talking about giving thanks. Um, you know, it's the Thanksgiving season, and I want to look at giving thanks and the power of thankfulness, because I believe it is a divine thing. God gave us the ability to give gratitude, uh, and it changes us. Uh, gratitude can change us, and we have so much to be thankful for, and so we're going to talk about that this morning. And what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be focusing on a couple psalms. In fact, Steve already read one of them, uh, Psalm 100. We'll also be in Psalm 69, and then we'll be in a, uh, a story of Jesus um, healing a group of lepers, and we're going to be talking about that this morning. So we're going to be talking about giving thanks for the things we have. We're going to be talking about giving thanks despite maybe some of the things that we have, we're going to be talking about Jesus and the 10 lepers and then how gratitude impacts us. And then I have a very tangible application for you here this morning. And so let's start off with this idea of thankfulness for what you have. You know, it's one of the interesting things as, as a child sometimes. I remember when I was growing up, I remember really struggling with always wanting more and always wanting things. And when you get into the holiday season, that's one of the things that happens is you, you're always thinking about those, what you're going to get for Christmas. And you're anticipating, and you're anticipating, and you're anticipating. And it is exciting when you receive those presents, but immediately afterwards, when those new toys become old, there's almost this letdown. And I always remember, I don't know if it was, maybe it was also the dark and the cold days and things like that, but almost being depressed after Christmas. But oftentimes what it had to do was a lack of gratitude, a lack of gracefulness. And one of the things that has happened as I've grown older, uh, I'm now in the 40s decade, okay, and so especially as I grow 
grow in, in 40s and as I develop uh, my family and my kids grow, the contentment and gratitude are something that I have seen grow in my life. And just the fruit that it's shown in my life is just amazing. We see gratitude and contentment all over scriptures. <coughs> And so let's read uh, Psalm 100 once again. It says, <coughs> Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God, and he has made us, and we are his. We are his people, we are the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. Thank God to, uh, give thanks to God, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, his faithfulness to all generations. And so we see here this is a thankfulness psalm. The psalms are songs, and they were written as to be sung among the people. And this is a song that reminds them to sing praises to the Lord for who he is, and, and that we should enter his courts with thanksgiving. It's the same idea we're talking about, coming to God with gratitude. And oftentimes, that can be a difficult thing for us. Now, one of the scriptures that are probably pretty familiar, and probably most pastors are going to reference this today, is First Thessalonians 5.18, where it says, Give thanks in all circumstances for that this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and so what I want to start out with this morning is this idea of giving thanks for what we have and I think it's important for us to understand and that as believers as as Americans in this country right now we should acknowledge the idea that we have a lifestyle that oftentimes we should just simply be great grateful that we were born in the time that we were in the place that we were Certainly there are challenges in this world and certainly we're not, not perfect, but in comparison to every other country that's ever existed, we, our lifestyles are at a point where we don't concern ourselves with things like starvation. In fact, we probably have the opposite problem like most of us over Thanksgiving where we, the eating problem that we have is too much eating. And, and we live in a place where safety is the norm. Now there are certainly things that happen and there are difficult things that happen, but for our families and for our, us as individuals, we live lives of relative safety. The people in our country that would live what we would call below the poverty line oftentimes live better than some of the best uh, conditions in other many countries in the world. And we are able to worship freely. There are many places throughout the world where they are unable to worship God, they are unable to speak the name of Jesus, have a Bible, and we have that privilege here. I mean, that is something that we should not take for granted and we should be thankful for. Even during, and especially during this pandemic time, I was just speaking with a pastor, even to our north. We're not just talking about countries where maybe there's oppression or, or, or a government that necessarily uh, takes away those rights based on being a different religion. Even our neighbors to the north throughout this pandemic have had heavy restrictions because they have really struggled throughout the pandemic due to their medical system being overwhelmed. And so many churches don't have the ability and the freedom freedom to worship the way that we do. We have so much that we should be thankful for. Oftentimes, I don't know about you, but I need to often practice this gratitude. I need to remind myself to come into his courts with thanksgiving in my heart because my default setting oftentimes is to forget all about those baseline things that we just take for granted and worry about the challenges in my life. And so I want to encourage us this morning to remember that we need to be thankful for the things we have because every single one of us has things that we can be thankful for. We cannot let the challenges and the struggles of today steal that from us. And we are called and we are commanded by the Bible. And we, of all people, who have Jesus, who have been saved from our sins, have been reconciled with God and at peace with God, have the most to be thankful for. And so we need to start off by recognizing what we have and having thanksgiving for it. Now that might seem kind of obvious, and I'm sure many of you maybe have had like over the weekend, maybe I don't know if your family has this tradition, but you have the tradition of maybe t somebody has to tell everything, everybody has to tell something that they're thankful for. And I think sometimes we can even roll our eyes at that, but it's an important thing for us to always make sure that we keep inventory of the things that God has blessed us with. We should always be able to look back and see what God has done for us. And the number one thing that we should always be able to look back for is that idea that God has made us his own. We can be thankful because we are no longer of this world, but we are his children adopted through faith, through the gospel, that we have been redeemed, restored, justified and made his own 
because of it. The Psalm uh, 106 talks about that, that we are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. And so we need to be thankful. Now the th- next thing I want to talk about is this idea that we need to be thankful despite what we have. We need to be thankful despite what we have. First of all, we need to be thankful for what we have. But now we need to be, despite, or, uh, we, we need to be thankful despite what we have. Here's what I mean by that. Has it been a little bit of a rough year? The last two years. You know, one of the things that's kind of maybe become cliche for people to say is, man, it's been a rough year and a half for me. And and I think one of the realizations we all maybe had not too long ago is that, wait, I'm not the only one. I don't know if I've talked to many people over the last year and a half that haven't had serious and significant struggles, that haven't had difficulties in their life. And so sometimes what we need to do is those things are things that we need to acknowledge. And the the Bible tells us that we need to acknowledge those things. And so sometimes what we need to do is have thanksgiving despite some of those struggles. And so this morning I wanted to make sure that we didn't just gloss over the idea that life is hard. And life is difficult. And there could be an individual or even many individuals in this place that are simply sitting here with a broken heart over what's happening in their life over what has happened in our, in our world, over what's currently happening in their situation right now. But we need to make sure that we are able to give thanks. See, Psalm 61 is a great example of this psalm. And, and one of the things that I love about the psalms as you read them, they're very real. That last psalm we talked about was all about thanksgiving, and yet this psalm starts out very differently. I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but I would encourage you to read the whole psalm. The first half of the psalm, or most of the psalm, actually is, is something like the first four verses. It says, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods swept over me. I am weary with crying out. My throat is parched, my eyes grow dim, waiting for my God. More is the number of the hairs on my head are are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What did I steal must I now restore? Does this maybe sound familiar? Have you ever been in a situation where you just cried out you felt like you couldn't find a foothold and the situation you felt like the flood was overcoming that it was going to overtake you that you couldn't even cry anymore you couldn't even cry out anymore this is the experience that many people have and 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 the psalmist here okay lives a difficult life david had difficulties he had enemies that were seeking after him and he did not ignore that He acknowledged that, and in God's word, there's an acknowledgement of the difficulty. See, Jesus doesn't, in the scriptures, claim that if you live a life after him, that everything becomes hunky-dory, that your life all of a sudden begins to work exactly how you want it to, everything goes in your favor, in fact, the exact opposite. In fact, at times, we can even have additional difficulties because of our faith. Because we love Jesus, because of the name of Jesus, we can receive additional struggles, And the psalmist acknowledges this. And it goes through verse after verse after verse after verse if you continue to read in Psalm 69. But then later on in the psalm, there's a turn. He lists 28, 29 different verses that talk about the difficulties that he has. And here's what it says uh, near the end. It says, but I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. Do you see the turn? I will praise your name, God, with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than ox or a bull with horns or hooves. Now there's more that he continues to do. So the psalmist here takes a turn, and basically what he's saying here is despite all these things, despite being overtaken by the flood, despite all the challenges that are happening in my life, I will praise you anyway. Your salvation will set me on high. I will be thankful. I will magnify you. It's like the preacher. uh, This was from a a daily bread devotional back in actually 1989 and it says there was a a Scottish minister who was known for his uplifting prayers from the pulpit. He always found something which to be grateful for. One Sunday morning the weather was gloomy. 
Uh, and the one church member thought to himself, certainly the preacher won't think of anything uh, in which to give thanks for the Lord with this wretched day that's going on. But much to his surprise, however, the preacher began his prayer saying, we thank thee, O God, that it's not always like this. We can always be thankful. We can always, even in the difficulties, even in the deep difficulties that we face in life, we can be thankful. And maybe it's because it's not always like this. And you know what? The Romans 12, 15 tells us that we need to rejoice with those who rejoice and we need to weep with those who weep. And it's important for us to acknowledge this morning the difficulties that some of us and some of our families and some people may be having. We need to be, always be careful on a morning like this, and, and we talk about this even, I think another time that we do this is, is it's like Mother's Day or Father's Day. We need to acknowledge that though the world may be celebrating, today somebody could be hurting. You know, the pandemic has been something that's been looming over us for a long time, not to mention other health issues that have come about. Many people have had health issues. There's been addictions that have been on the increase. Mental health issues have been on a heavy increase since the pandemic. A domestic abuse has been going on. How many of us know and have prayed about the Waukesha Parade and the difficulties and the, just the tragedy that happened at the holiday parade there? The scriptures are honest about this. There's a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations that's all about this idea of lifting up and being honest with God when we are in pain and we are hurting. The Psalms do this and we ought to acknowledge it. So this morning, as we think about Thanksgiving and we think about what we have, let's acknowledge some of the things that we have and don't want to have. What is that thing, what is that pain, what is that difficulty right now that is causing you pain? And yet, can we be like this preacher and still be thankful in the face of that? That is one of the marks of a Christian is that though the world around us can be falling around, falling down. We can have the peace that surpasses all understanding promised to us by the scriptures. That it is not our circumstances that determine our peace or our thankfulness, but it is who we belong to. It is our relationship with God that is unchanging and everlasting. That we can trust and lean on that relationship and our circumstances are not what, what really determine that. Now, this has actually been proven scientifically. There was a study done in, of two groups. These two groups that they were observed. One group was a group of lottery winners. Okay? The other group was a group that actually broke their back. Okay? I don't think they had to sign up for this, like sign up for one group or the other, like they didn't like manually break your back or something. This was just people that either won the lottery or they were hospitalized for a broken back. Now those are two very different, like the day that that happened for this person was a very different day than for this person. Would you guys agree? And would you also agree that winning the lottery and breaking your back are, would both be called probably life-changing experiences? Would you agree with that? And I don't think that we have to sit here and weigh which one is better and which one is worse for us. Would you agree with that? And now some of you may think that it would be much easier, although we all know the stories of lottery winners oftentimes not becoming happy, but in comparison to having your back broken and some of the difficulties you have, you would think that one group would definitely be more happy than the other one. Yet, after a year of observation, one year later, their average happiness and contentment level in their life between the two groups actually stayed exactly the same. There was no difference in the contentment of the overall group, of the individuals, of the people who either broke their back or won the lottery. This is a very tangible way for us to see that our happiness, our contentment, our thankfulness has nothing to do with our circumstances. It does not come from the outside. Thankfulness and gratitude does not come from the outside. It comes from the inside. And so we need to acknowledge that even though there are things that we have that we can be thankful for, and there are things that we have that we wish we didn't have, yet we can still be thankful. We need to be a thankful people. Now let's look in Luke chapter 17 and we're going to talk and we're going to see an occasion where we saw both the grateful and the ungrateful in one story here. So in Luke 17, 11 through 19 it says, on the way to Jerusalem he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village he, met, uh, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices and saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, 
Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and praised God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were there not ten? Where are the nine? Was no, uh, was no one found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So we see that this is an occasion where we see in the, the book of Luke that once again, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And on the way, he is interrupted by these, this group of lepers. Now it's interesting, this group of ten lepers, lepers would have been uh, considered the outcasts of the community. It was a, a disease that they knew very little about. And so if somebody had leprosy, they were basically cast away from everybody else, and they were seen uh, as totally and completely unclean. They had to separate themselves from society, and they had to be apart. There was no known cure for leprosy. That was part of the problem. And they didn't know how it would, was spread, and so there was this huge stigma. So if somebody had leprosy, they were marked for the rest of their life, and they were separated. Now it's interesting, we know here that, that one of the individuals here was actually a Samaritan. See, Jews and Samaritans had no dealings with one another. We remember that from uh, John chapter 4 when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well. But the Samaritans and the Jews had no dealings with each other. Both the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. There was such historical differences. And in fact, we saw some of that in Ezra and Nehemiah as the, the, the uh, Samaritans wanted to come in and help with the temple and they refused it. There was animosity between these groups. And yet... With leprosy, with this difficulty, this group has now been formed. That are some Jewish and at least one is a Samaritan. Now the, the other boundaries that, have been broke, or that were set up have been broken down because they have this affliction. And oftentimes we can see that happening. When we have afflictions and difficulties in our life, that can sometimes bring us together with people we normally wouldn't be together with. And so what a thing to be thankful for. That even those who are, are outcasts and have difficulties and struggles and those that we have talked about that are weeping today, there's oftentimes community. And when we have that, that's part of the reason that God does that is he sometimes allows us to go through seasons of pain so that we can comfort others in pain. Now Jesus sees this group of lepers that are together and they cry out and they stay at a distance because there's no known cure for the leprosy. Now it's interesting though that the Bible actually has a process listed in the Old Testament for being cleansed of leprosy, which is kind of interesting. It's, an, uh, it's a disease that wasn't known to have a, a cure, and yet the Bible says that there's a process that they go through where they go to the priest to be inspected to see if they are continue to have leprosy, and then they are cleansed, and there's a process for seven days where they are apart, and then they can be restored to the community. And yet, that process normally wasn't taken because Leprosy was something that was found to be uncurable. And so these, they stayed at a distance, and Jesus, just through his word, was able to tell them to go be cleansed. And they were healed. Now once again, as we see, one of them recognized what was happening, and he turned back and he praised Jesus. He fell at his feet, and it's interesting that it's the Samaritan. Now, once again, we need to be reminded of the significance, and we need to put ourselves in the seats of the audience that Luke is writing to here. To us, the word Samaritan actually probably is a positive thing, because in our culture, we say Samaritan's purse, or a good Samaritan. But in this culture, the good Samaritan would have been an oxymoron. They would have viewed a Samaritan as about one of the worst people that could be, because they took the the Jewish faith, and they had twisted it. They had turned it. They had done some things. They had mixed it with uh, some of the other cultures of the people of the land that the Assyrians had brought in. And so when it says that this was the Samaritan that was the one who thanked Jesus, and it was the Israelites, the ones who should have known God, should have been in right relationship with God, that ignored the fact that they had been cleansed, but it was the Samaritan is a significant thing. And Jesus acknowledges, were there not ten? Where are the nine? Now I was reading through, I was reading through, uh, and Charles Brown uh, wrote a newsletter where he talked about this. Why did only one cleansed leper return and thank Jesus? He had some suggestions. Here's where some possible reasons that maybe he thought, these are not scripture, they're not 
actual pro- things, by the way, okay. But maybe examine, have you ever been in a situation like this? They had been uh, lepers, they had been separated, they had been ill, and yet all of a sudden they are healed. But maybe one of them said, I'll wait to see if this cure is real, to go back to God. Maybe this isn't true. Maybe I'm still sick. Maybe this isn't true. Have you ever done that with God? Has God ever done something in your life and you maybe not trusted what he did for you? Am I really forgiven? Am I really changed? Am I really different? Or how about the second one? Going to wait to see if this lasts. Not sure that this is going to last. Not sure that that what Jesus did was actually long-lasting. Another one perhaps said, I'll see Jesus later. I'll probably see Jesus later and I'll thank him later. And yet, does he ever have that opportunity again? We all don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We may never see uh, a loved one once again. And and to say thank you to God, we may never get that chance. One decided he probably never had leprosy. That was probably just a rash. Because leprosy is unhealable. One said he would have gotten well anyway. He He was on a new cleanse diet thing. He probably would have been better anyway. I can do it myself. I could make myself better. One gave glory to the priest. When he went to the priest and the priest said, you are clean, obviously it's the priest. One said, oh well, Jesus really didn't do anything. He just said something from afar. One said, any rabbi could have done it. And the last one said, it really hasn't changed anything much for me. So those other nine had all these excuses, and oftentimes that's what we can do when we think about Thanksgiving. We can have excuses. We can have other reasons why we don't want to give glory to God. We oftentimes really struggle with Thanksgiving. In fact, in Warren uh, Wearsby's uh, commentary on Colossians, he tells of a story of a a ministerial student from Evanston, Illinois, who had spent time in a life-saving squad back in 1860 where uh, a ship had gone aground in Lake Michigan uh, near Evanston. And this uh, student waded out again and again and again into the frigid waters. Seventeen different times he brought passengers to rescue. In the process, his health was ruined and he was uh, permanently damaged due to some of the difficulties he experienced. And yet years later, at his funeral, it was noted that not one of the people he rescued ever thanked him. Isn't that sad? Let us not be like those who would not give thanks, who would ignore giving thanks. Whether that's because maybe we have some excuse, maybe we we lack the faith to recognize what God has done, or maybe we're overcome by those things that we don't want in our lives. Let's use the example that we find here of Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom was a watchmaker, a Dutch watchmaker, and this is from uh, her Uh, kind of autobiography, uh, The Hiding Place. She and her family were watchmakers during the Holocaust, and they hid Jews uh, during that time. Eventually, they were caught, and they were sent to the prison to a concentration camp in which her father died during that time. Uh, They were part of the Ravensbrück Death Camp, which is a notorious death camp among uh, the concentration camps. When they discovered where they were going to sleep, her and her sister, they found that it was infested with fleas. Now, I've never had fleas personally, um, but apparently fleas are some of the most uncomfortable things that a person can have for an extended period of time. It's like described as basically having mosquito bites that you can't slap because they're so small and you're you're just itching constantly. And yet, even though these beds, the hay, the the, the horrible quarters were filled uh, filled with fleas, Corey's sister Betsy reminded them of 1 Thessalonians 1 I'm mean, sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, that they should give thanks in all circumstances for it's the will of God in Christ Jesus for them. So she encouraged the sisters to pray a prayer of thanksgiving in that moment, even for the fleas. Now, their upbeat and their encouragement throughout camp, throughout that time, was huge. They encouraged others during that time. They held group meetings, and it was later discovered that the fleas actually protected them during those group meetings. 
Because the guards were so scared to go in there and be exposed to the fleas, they were unwilling to go into the barracks, which allowed them to have these group meetings to encourage other people and build them up in the concentration camps. Ultimately, unfortunately, Corey's sister Betsy did ultimately die in the camp, but 12 days later, Corey was released on a medical records clerical error, and she was able to get out, and yet she continued the ways of encouraging, and she continued to shelter those who were weak and disabled during that time who were fearing extermination, and she taught love and forgiveness, and even had an opportunity later on, even though her, she had lost her family, lost her sister 12 days before she was released, one day was able to uh, forgive two of the guards of Ravensbrook, including one of her that were, um, that were particularly cruel to her sister Betsy. Man, there's something divine about that. That's inhuman, isn't it? To think about such things that gratitude and the power of thankfulness and what it can do in our lives and in this world and how it can shine a light in the darkness. Now I want to kind of finish up with just some impacts. I believe God has wired us in a way that he has wired us to benefit from thankfulness. Did you know that thankfulness and gratitude release serotonin and dopamine in your brains? Serotonin and dopamine are actually the happiness and reward uh, chemicals that are in your brain. They have done brain scans where they've found that, that when we are thankful, that serotonin and dopamine are released. Uh, thankfulness and gratitude help against anxiety. Uh, it breaks the fear cycle and the fear response with a con- where uh, anxiety and, and fear responses actually are constantly scanning for danger. But in brain scans, it shows that part of the brain, the hippocampus and the amygdala, are activated um, and, and regulate those feelings during that time and give a feeling of uh, safety and contentment and calm when we are thankful. Have you ever noticed that it's really hard to be thankful when you're anxious? You ever notice that? Or how about it's really hard to be anxious when you're thankful? Or is it really hard to be thankful when you're depressed? Or is it really hard to be depressed when you're thankful? See, what it does is it actually reduces stress, the stress hormone of cortisol. We can see this physically. It creates a better immune system, less aches and pains, better blood pressure and heart health. You have better sleep when you have an attitude that is of gratitude and thanksgiving. And relationships that are based and centered around thanksgiving oftentimes uh, have more trust, more loyalty, and long-lasting, according to studies. It also increases our generosity. We do good for others when we know that we are blessed, when we know that there's a, a feeling of abundance. Let's be grateful. Let's be thanks, thankful. Now, I want to end, and I want to give you four options. Okay, so if you're here today, this is an all-skate. That means everybody has to participate, okay? You have to pick one of these four And that's literally doing something right now. So either pick up your phone or pick up a pen, pick up something. You have four options how I want you to apply this today. The first option is you can make a gratitude list. You can write down at least three or four of the things that you are thankful for right now. And I would encourage you to make this a habit that you would on a regular basis take some time and just jot down the things that you're thankful for. Whether it's family, whether it's job, whether it's health, whether it's um, whatever you have, uh, whether it's a church body who loves you and cares for you, write that down. So make a gratitude list. Write at least three to four things right now that you're thankful for. Or, if you don't have a pen and paper and you have your phone, email yourself. Email yourself at least one thing that you're thankful for that you will later on go to your email and be reminded of that. Email yourself something to be thankful for. How about this one? Text somebody else something you're thankful for and make that thing be them. Text somebody you are thankful for and tell them that you are thankful for them and that you appreciate them, that that you love them, that, that right now you are thankful for what they are in your life. Or how about this, the last one. Right now as we close in prayer, pray a prayer of thanksgiving. But this one, I want you to pray the prayer of thanksgiving for the fleas in your life. What fleas in your life do you have right now that you really wish you didn't have? Maybe when I said, be thankful for what 
uh, despite what you have? What is that thing that you have to be thankful despite of? Can you say a prayer right now, regardless of what that is, and thank God for that right now? Not knowing what he might be doing and not knowing what might be going on with that thing. And knowing that ultimately God has a plan to not only get us through those things, not only to uh, 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 make good come from difficulties, and, and we may not see that this side of heaven, but that we can know that he loves us and he will use it for good because we know that he uses all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So which one of those? Are you going to make a gratitude list? Three to four things right now that you're thankful for. Are you going to email yourself one thing so that later on you can be reminded what you're thankful for? Can you text somebody you are thankful for and tell them you are thankful for them? Or, as we pray, can you pray for the fleas in your life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. We thank you for giving us so much, Lord, that we can be thankful for all that we have. We can be thankful for the good things in our lives. Help us to recognize those things. Help us to not overlook the things uh, that we ought to be thankful for, Lord. Oftentimes we can be overcome by those other things that, that appear so loud and so difficult that we don't get to see the blessings you have given to us. Help us to see those things. And Lord, help us to see the things that might be distracting us and might be difficult. The fleas in our life that, that you, we would see that you are using even those things in our life to be glorifying to you, to form us, to change us, to do a good work, Lord. Help us to have that idea in our hearts of abundance, contentment, and gratitude. Let us reap the benefits of gratitude and thankfulness that you have hardwired into our bodies, Lord, that we would be grateful and that we would show gratitude to others, that we would encourage others, and that we would be light in darkness. Even during a dark time, Lord, that we would shine like lights in this dark time. We thank you, Lord, for that. Help us to be a church of gratitude. Help us to constantly be reminded that it wouldn't be simply be just a season, a, a holiday where we eat and eat too much, but that it would be a lifestyle. Lord, help us to do that and help us to glorify you in it. We thank you for that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand in response and sing praises to him.